Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Aaron Dykes, your host on this InfoWars Nightly News for Wednesday, May 9th, 2012. Tonight, U.S. Army admits re-education camp manual not intended for public release. Public Affairs Director falsely claims document does not apply within the United States, but we've got proof that it does. Then, Congressional Democrats introduce amendment to outlaw self-defense. Meanwhile, the UK bans self-defense expert from entering the country. And the CIA catches itself in a new underwear bomb plot. Another manufactured hoax from beginning to end. And World Net Daily's Chelsea Schilling joins us via video Skype to discuss Facebook's selective censorship and their inability to stop rampant pedophilia groups. All that and more on the InfoWars Nightly News. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We are also going to cover a brief history of false flag terrorism tonight, so stay with us. But first in the news, the ongoing story concerning the internment and resettlement document leaked from the Army has not only been confirmed, but a spokesperson has come forward to say it was indeed not intended for public release. Paul Joseph Watson, of course, has the story. Public Affairs Director falsely claims the document does not apply within the U.S. We've covered that at length over the past several days about how various quotes show it also applies within the continental United States. There's use of Social Security numbers and a, re a reference to agencies, including FEMA and Homeland Security, that op operate legally only within the U.S. And so we have the Fort Leonard Wood Public Affairs Director, Tiffany Wood, who's provided the first official response to this internment and resettlement document, a shocking U.S. Army document that outlines the implementation of re-education camps, admitting the manual was not intended for public release and claiming its provisions only apply outside the United States, a completely disproved uh, position as exposed by the language. Now, this also is interesting because Fort Leonard Wood is the location of FEMA camps we exposed some two or three months ago there in Missouri. Uh, let's flash back to that story. Sources expose FEMA training camp in Missouri. An anonymous source sent us photos uh, to Infowars.com of a FEMA training camp at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And we've got the sign there that says training area, Camp Charlie, mock internment facility, and also you see there pictures of the camps. And so they are certainly training to intern people. And here we have the document proving that it not only has to do with various types of foreign enemies, but may well have to do with so-called domestic enemies as well. And our great researchers at the PrisonPlanet.tv forum have further dug into this terrible and ominous document showing how it's not only to be used within the continental United States for politically motivated civilian internees, but that they will also be targeting militias or other armed groups with opinions contrary to that of the government. You can see that for yourself. It's a long posting. It's on the Prison Planet Forum, or you could just pull up the actual document itself and read about it. But just more just sick information continues to pile up that there is a de facto war against the American people. Political dissidents will be silenced first through the chilling effect of various policies and possibly silenced through actually being deterred. Uh, detained, that is, inside these facilities. You can see where the training, we've exposed all the other documents for contracting labor, how KBR built the camps starting back in 2006, how they've resurrected old mothballed camps, including some of the camps used to intern Japanese American citizens during World War II. What a sad legacy, what a sad fact. They're using continuity of government excuses to resurrect these things and help them go live. Just sick. But now we want to turn to the latest case of false flag terror, where the CIA has caught itself in another false flag bombing, the new underwear bombing episode. Let's go now to the video Alex did yesterday to expose this new case. Thank you for joining us. Tonight we have more confirmation on top of the mountain of evidence that most terror worldwide in the last 30 years or so has been provocateur or staged. 
Now, you know the Gulf of Tonkin was staged to get us into Vietnam in 64. That's been declassified. And Operation Ajax, the U.S. and British governments used radical Muslim extremists to overthrow the government of uh, Iran while claiming they were actually fighting those groups. This is done over and over again. You know Al-Qaeda and the Taliban was created by the CIA, working with the Pakistanis, the Israelis, and Brits. All of this is on record, but we learn it decades later. Back with the 7-7 bombings six, seven years ago, it came out on Fox News. Look this up. They had FBI agents that went public and reported. I'm about to get to the new news, but I'll give you some background here. And reported on the fact that a SWAT, the leader of the 7-7 bombing, was a MI6 asset. And there's our uh, original article with a link to the Fox News video, terror expert, and it goes over the entire report. There's Fox News with FBI agent Loftus breaking it down. It was also the London Independent. Okay, continuing with this information, ladies and gentlemen. Paul Watson has the news breaking at PrisonPlanet.com and Infowars.com. This just happened yesterday, and we told you, underwear bomber too, but instead of just setting up a patsy, they just say, we don't know who he is or where he is. But we found some underwear with a firecracker, so give you all your rights up and Obama's going to save you. Well, now, Al-Qaeda bomber was a CIA informant, prisonplanet.com. But wait, here's the Huffington Post and the Associated Press are reporting Al-Qaeda bomb plot, would-be bomber, was CIA informant. And it just goes on from there. We're told, naked body scanners, TSA on the streets. But what happened two Christmases ago? The Christmas Day bomber, Mutalib, we had the eyewitnesses on first. Kurt Haskell and his wife saw the U.S. government getting him on the plane without a passport. A month and a half later, questioned in Congress, the Under Secretary of State, Mr. Kennedy, admitted an unnamed U.S. intelligence agency told us to get him a visa and get him on that aircraft without a passport. Boom, that was staged. 7-7. Boom, commanded and run by an MI6 operative. On record, the guys that were part of it thought they were part of a drill. They were anti-Muslim extremists, and they were blown up on the trains and those buses, or that bus. And the government was running a drill of the exact targets being attacked at the same time. That's Peter Powers, the head of Visor Consultancy, admitting that on ITN and BBC. Look it up. And it gets worse. Five years ago, members of SAS assigned to MI6 in Iraq dressed up like Wahhabists killing Shiites to get sectarian warfare going on between the two groups. I could keep giving you examples. These aren't theories. These are facts. So now they just say, hey, we had a threat to, of a deadly firecracker, give all your rights up. But instead of having some drugged up patsy like Mutalib, you know, drugged rolling him onto the plane, who actually thinks he's part of al-Qaeda, they just make up this new guy and say, oh my gosh, it's so sophisticated, it's so deadly, it's so evil. Of course, they were reporting yesterday, U.S. thinks underwear bomber built bomb with Al-Qaeda in Yemen. Oh my gosh, uh, U.S. sends airport security guide to other countries. Yeah, buy the naked body scanners to keep you safe, the new domestic police state arms race. All of this, absolute pure bull. We never see modern cases of where these hyped-up terror attacks weren't provocateur or purely, absolutely staged. We know that the so-called hijackers of 9-11 were trained at U.S. military bases. That was even in AP Newsweek. But we're supposed to ignore all that information. They were just people taking part in a drill, just like the 7-7 patsy. So here it is. AP, Al-Qaeda bomb plot, would-be bomber, was CIA informant, associated press. Oh, but they say it was a double agent. Oh, that's how they spin it. Just like the troops have to grow the opium to fight Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. And uh, they got to rape children in Abu Ghraib in front of their parents to fight Al-Qaeda. Well, I mean, I'd be for Al-Qaeda above raping children. And of course, Al-Qaeda CIA, so that would be raping children anyway, so I wouldn't join that. I mean, this is staged. It's a global corporate empire who needs to act like it's under attack so it can take your liberties and give itself trillions of dollars in tax money a year, just in the U.S. alone, three or four trillion worldwide, in the name of keeping us safe. You know, the Olympics with missiles around it for Al-Qaeda's Air Force. This is a pipe dream. The globalists think you're so dumb. All their propaganda is designed for people not 
paying attention. Remember, Al-Qaeda flies its flag over Libya and is exterminating blacks by the tens of thousands right now. Totally racist. Remember, Al-Qaeda is being used to attack Syria. No fan of Assad, but compared to Al-Qaeda, he's a great guy. They're blowing up police stations and being called freedom fighters. It's in the news that Al-Qaeda is the good guy now. And we're supposed to segue to the domestic extremist, that is, people that want liberty. Unbelievable information unfolding in front of us. But wait, a final piece of news in this spectrum of information we're breaking down here that's only the tip of the iceberg. You see, the, rel the regular teleprompter news is some bimbo reading off a teleprompter what the globalists wrote in the central CBS broadcast center for all the major networks by private PR firms and the CIA and foreign governments and others. Here, it's full spectrum analysis. And we're even taking mainstream news where they have to admit this stuff and laying it out to connect the dots for you. Here is the London Telegraph today, U.S. secretly releasing Taliban prisoners from Bagram Air Base. Same thing at Camp X-Ray in Gitmo. Same thing in Abu Ghraib uh, in Iraq, not just uh, in Afghanistan. This is what they do. They get people in these re-education camps to find out who can be operatives to go out and pose as synthetic artificial terror. If you want to invade countries, you've got to create the synthetic threat. If you want to take liberties, you've got to create the synthetic threat to take the projection of the bad guy so you can play the part of the good guy, when in truth, the New World Order is controlling both sides of it. You understand that? This is what they're doing. So there it is. America has secretly been releasing high-level Taliban prisoners from a top security military prison as part of negotiations with insurgents. Folks, the only insurgents they're fighting is opium farmers that don't want to get a lower price. It's a bunch of tribalists in Afghanistan who've always been killing each other. That's why Alexander the Great couldn't beat them. The Romans, the Persians, the, the, the Brits, no one can beat them because they don't have a culture or society that's centralized. They're cavemen. It's, it's beyond medieval. No one can conquer them because the guy over the next hill hates his cousin down the road. This is beyond Appalachian hillbillies to the power of infinity. So the globalists are there to get the $500 billion a year in opium. That's all that's happening. Okay, as we told you yesterday, this is staged, had all the earmarks. When they came out and said, oh, can't have Bin Laden, he's in the ocean. Oh, who's this guy? We don't know. We found some underwear with a firecracker in him. Now, America, fall to your knees. We have an M80. <laughs> and the Republic just goes, take my rights, grope my wife and daughters, I'm so afraid of a guy with a turban and with an M80 in his underwear. And now he's CIA, and because that leaks out, and now there's congressional investigation calls, what do they say? He was a double agent. <laughs> Even after they said that about a SWAT in the 7-7 bombings, it came out he could fly in and out of the country and was being protected. They're not double agents, they're agents of the mega banks playing the West off against Islam. Every time people in Islamist countries try to build societies and civilizations, which they're very capable of, the globalists send in a bunch of jihadis to blow the hell out of the capital. Okay? Okay? That's been the plan. It's been the plan since the end of World War II. The Brits used the plan with Lawrence of Arabia before that, 50-something years. Look into history. Learn about it. Get informed. All this propaganda is designed as if you're an idiot. It's designed for people halfway paying attention. Gee, Marge, they protect us from another one of them radical, evil sand people. Yeah, well, that's all right, because TSA is going to grope you tonight, honey, and that'll keep you safe. And the, but the border's wide open. All right, that's it for this area of the report. Get this video and the information by Paul Watson and InfoWars.com out to everybody. And of course, the latest case with the CIA bungling its own operation against the United States is just an ongoing part of the false flag salvo that's been used against populations throughout history. Chronicles of false flag terror are endless. The pages would take hours and hours, if not weeks, to read. But you know many of the cases. The globalists have used it against us so many times just in the 20th century. The Spanish-American War uh, was goaded on by the sinking of the USS Maine. 
World War I was goaded on by the sinking of the HMS Lusitania. The German U-boat was demonized after it attacked a passenger ship carrying cargo. Pearl Harbor is now exposed to be basically a false flag attack to get the U.S. into World War II. We've seen it over and over countless times throughout history uh, from all different countries, but including the United States. Let's look at what is false flag terror. Its definition is covert operations conducted by governments, corporations, or other organizations which appear uh, to be carried out by other entities. This, of course, was carried, covered in Alex's seminal film, Terror Storm, that you're seeing clips of from here. Whether it's a patsy, a mole, or some other setup operation, the point is to convince people we have to take further military action, we have to go into new theaters of war. Look at the Reichstag that we also covered there in Terror Storm. Hitler used it to storm to power and lead into what became World War II. What did he do? He burned Germans' own parliament building, blamed it on communists, and set up a patsy so he could take more power and crack down on the population according to the Nazi plan. It's just disgusting, and yet it's proven in history. And it probably looks familiar because the U.S. has clearly resorted to very similar tactics. Covering a little bit more of this is Darren McBreen and a key package he did covering false flag terror. In 1953, the CIA and British intelligence staged terror attacks to overthrow the democratically elected leader of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh. Mossadegh had nationalized Iran's oil fields and denied British Petroleum a monopoly. U.S. and British intelligence operatives launched a successful coup d'etat and overthrew the Iranian government, replacing the regime with a ruthless dictatorship while seizing control of Iran's oil supply. 1964. U.S. warships were apparently attacked by North Vietnamese PT boats, an incident that kicked off the U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. The attack was a staged event that never actually took place. What followed was an excuse by President Lyndon Johnson to dramatically expand the scale of the Vietnam War. Ultimately, at the cost of three or four million dead Vietnamese and 58,000 Americans. June 8, 1967, the USS Liberty, an American naval vessel sailing off the coast of Gaza, was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of Israel. The well-coordinated attack, which lasted for hours, resulted in the deaths of 34 crewmen, 170 injured, and catastrophic damage to the ship one of the most highly decorated vessels in U.S. history. Egypt was to be blamed for the attack, to serve as a pretext to drag the U.S. and her allies into war in the Middle East. If not for the heroic efforts of the ship's captain and his brave crew, the Liberty would have faced almost certain destruction. The truth about Israel's attack and subsequent White House cover-up continues to be officially concealed from the American people to this day. And so these cases are particularly important because the Gulf of Tonkin, the USS Liberty, these other cases have been fully or at least partially declassified. We know there was a lie and deception going on, and it's proven in the record. In more recent cases, we only have clues and piles of evidence, even though it's not fully admitted, but it fits the same pattern. And of course, we have documents from the 60s, including Operation Northwoods, where they theorized on whether or not they might use hijacked airline deceptions and, and other tricks to get us into a war with Cuba and so forth and so on. So you can see where government has been methodically plotting these plans and in many cases putting them to action. Flash forward to the war on terror. We know it was concocted and we were contrived into these wars just based on all the propaganda and fear mongering alone. But then when you look at the actual cases, it continues to fit this false flag mode. Look at at the Madrid bombing. It didn't add up. It didn't actually connect to the supposed Al-Qaeda people they wanted us to believe were part of it. Instead, it fit into the terror agenda. It fit in with the timing. Then we saw the 7-7 bombing, which appeared to again be part of our Muslim radical extremist enemies we're supposed to go to war with around the globe, yet people like Peter Powers were running simultaneous drills that appeared to be almost identical at the exact same time in the same location, and when they were later confronted about it, oh, nothing going on there, I'm going to walk into this broom closet and not answer your questions. 
And we, so we see this going on and on. And when we look further into history, our explanation for false flag terror becomes part of our ongoing history of foreign policy. You've got Hillary Clinton, Brzezinski, so many figures talking about how we funded the early groups that later developed into Al-Qaeda over in Afghanistan and Pakistan to fight against the Soviets. We covertly armed them, trained them, gave them funding, and go to them into war, then later used them as our uh, prefabricated enemy. And we've also got the clip of John Loftus explaining how the supposed mastermind of the 7-7 bombing as what was a member of British intelligence and goes all the way back to this history of resistance against the Soviet Union. And then they later used them to fight in Kosovo and the other parts of the Balkan War, and then later used them since the USS Cole bombing as our new shadow enemy. Let's go to some of those clips right now. SWAT is believed to be the mastermind of all the bombings in London. From on the 7 7 and 7 21, this is the guy, we think. This is the guy, and what's really embarrassing is that you, the entire British police are out chasing him, and one wing of the British government, MI6, or the British Secret Service, right. has been hiding him. And this has been a real source of contention between CIA, Hold on, John. Justice Department, and Britain. MI6 has been hiding him. Are you saying that he has been working for them? Oh, I'm not saying it. This is what the Muslim Sheikh said in an interview in a British newspaper back in 2001. So he's a double agent, or what? He's a double agent. He's yeah, working for the... So he's working for the Brits to try to give them information about Al-Qaeda, but in reality, he's still an Al-Qaeda operative. Yeah. The CIA and the Israelis all accused MI6 of letting all these terrorists live in London. We also have a history of kind of moving in and out of Pakistan. I mean, let's remember here... The people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. And we did it because we were locked in this struggle with the Soviet Union. They invaded Afghanistan, and we did not want to see them control Central Asia. Let's deal with the ISI and the Pakistani military, and let's go recruit these Mujahideen and, so that we can go beat the Soviet Union. And we, guess what? They retreated. They lost billions of dollars and it led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So there's a, a very strong argument which is wasn't a bad investment to end the Soviet Union but let's be careful what we sow because we will harvest. And so for people who have studied some history who've raised some questions about what's going on with what appears to be false flag terror they really hope we're going to get caught up in some chicken or egg question of whether or not CIA informants implanted inside the al-Qaeda cells are really working for us or whether they're part of their operation. Well, the point is it's just all staged. It's not a real chicken and egg question when you realize the entire foreign policy apparatus was unhatched from those in power in the West, and they've been leading the gag all along. Look at the underwear bombing case with Kurt Haskell, where he just happened to be a witness getting on the same plane, but caught them red-handed using intelligence handlers to get this doped up, duped patsy on the plane for this phony bomb just to scare everyone into accepting, uh, you know, unacceptable conditions like radiating body scanners and a greater erosion of civil rights, uh, you know, in airport and transportation. It's just sick. We've exposed that case to no end, and instead they have continued the gag by reissuing a new underwear bombing case. Well, we get what's going on. The CIA isn't just infiltrating al-Qaeda. They're leading them. They're using them as a tool to crack down on the population and enter into all kinds of perpetual war at any time they want. It just makes you sick. It should, anyway. Look into it if you don't know what we're talking about. Meanwhile, more false flagging and, and using infiltration and little doped-up dupes to get things done. We exposed last week how in Minnesota they were feeding drugs to people so they could discredit the Occupy movement. What? The Minnesota Department of Public Safety has now issued a press release uh, uh, announcing the suspicion of their drug recognition program conducted by the Minnesota State Patrol after it was exposed that they gave drugs to their little informant and tried to get them to rat out Occupy movement, make them look bad, uh, report on people who may or may not have been involved in any kind of bad behavior. Here's part of that press release now. Minnesota Public Safety Commissioner Mona Doman announced today that the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, BCA, has launched a criminal investigation 
and allegations that a Hutchinson police officer provided marijuana to a potential subject in Minnesota's drug evaluation and classification training last week. And so now they're going to investigate into it and get to the bottom of it. And it'll never happen again unless they need a new terror attack or a new way to discredit movements who are simply critical of the cronyism going on in government, of the eroding standard of living we're facing, of the fact that the rich are only getting richer and conspiring more and more with the ongoing conspiracies. Meanwhile, though, the British Army is preparing to attack Al-Qaeda's Air Force during the Olympics. They've got mobile battalions and batteries and fighter jets positioned in the civilian portions of London for these upcoming games. And people are wondering, why do they have such a show of force? I think it's just to intimidate the public. I mean, Al-Qaeda's Air Force, that's a joke, too. Al-Qaeda's Air Force during the Libya war, for example, was none other than NATO. Well, it's true. We provided air cover for them so Al-Qaeda rebels could go and topple Gaddafi and his loyal forces and take over the country for the globalists to put in radical Muslim extremists, uh, give credence to the Muslim Brotherhood, and really just radicalize the clash of civilizations they've been wanting for decades. <laughs> Just funny. And we got a press release on that, too, warning the, the lowly citizens that they're going to be under military occupation just for some stupid sports event. Mm. Meanwhile, congressional Democrats are introducing an amendment that would outlaw self-defense. Yes, it's the ongoing stirring up of emotions over the Trayvon Martin case. Uh, you've got Keith Ellison and Ryo Grijavala, two different members of Congress who have introduced this amendment which would be passed under the Omnibus Crime Control and Safety Streets Act of 1968 to take away federal funding from states, I think there's about 18 of them, that have laws similar to or related to stand your ground. So they want to continue to embattle the public over the right to bear arms over this race riot case that they've been exploiting in the media, editing tapes to deceive us about, and on and on. Now, these congressmen admit that they don't really expect this legislation to be passed, but it's part of this larger salvo of hating gun ownership, of wanting to disarm uh, the victims and empower the criminals because they do not trust the citizenry. You've seen where they consider us to be the enemy of America, the people of America to be the enemy of America, and this is more of it. But what is the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968? I went to Wikipedia and discovered it had been passed during the LBJ term in, a, in response to the JFK assassination, believing that Oswald proved how easy it was to get a gun without uh, proper background checks or other controls on private ownership of gun rights. We know this goes back to the United Nations Disarmament Treaty signed by the United States and many other countries. And it was a precursor, of course, to the 1968 Gun Control Act, modeled on none other than Nazi Gun Control Disarmament Acts. But it's really sick because they cite national security. They say to prevent the overthrow of the government, which was overtaken by a coup of criminals in the JFK assassination, they want to pursue greater gun restrictions of the people so the people don't take their country back based on another provocateur false flag case with none other than Lee Harvey Oswald. What did he claim to be? A patsy. Just a patsy, and certainly he was. It's proven, beyond a shadow of a doubt, by the way, that he couldn't have done that shooting without a little alley-oop assistance from God or maybe the Warren Commission writers to suspend the laws of time and gravity and the space continuum and on and on. Just another strange tie-in to that famous case of when our country began to go clearly in the wrong direction. Meanwhile, the UK has banned a self-defense expert from entering the country. Was it because he was critical of the UK's self-defense policies, or was it because he was coming to teach citizens how to uh, defend themselves if they're attacked by a criminal? Now, the UK already has a lot of laws against knife ownership. They basically have a gun ban, and now they really don't even want people to learn how to do hand-to-hand -hand self-defense combat. That's the case surrounding U.S. Navy SEAL Tim Larkin, who tried to enter the country but was denied, where he was going to give seminars and, as I mentioned, had been critical of the Labor Party's policies and other U.K. policies discouraging British citizens from using any kind of self-defense whatsoever. Just a celebration 
of that sick culture. And it reminds us of how talk show hosts were not allowed into the country because they were critical of the UK. And on and on, you can see where these policies are growing into a total tyranny to clamp down our populations. Now, coming up, as you know, we have our guest, Chelsea Schilling. She's a WorldNet Daily writer. She's exposing how Facebook and other social media are actually empowering the pedophiles. Meanwhile, this just broke while we were preparing the show. Viewing child pornography online now deemed not to be a crime, according to a New York court, that if you're proven to be viewing child pornography, that's okay as long as you weren't deliberately saving the images or deliberately sharing them. Meanwhile, they want to pass legislation to shut down websites on supposed copyright infringement without notification or due process to defend yourself and explain if you had a good reason. But child pornography is to be accepted, and we're going to be conditioned that this is a normal part of society. Just sick. All that's coming up. But first, we'll hit the quote of the day, and then we have a speech from Senator Rand Paul. Today's quote comes from the War of 1812, the Indian leader, a single twig breaks, but the bundle of twigs is strong. That's from Tecumseh. I do not recall what tribe he's part of, but you can see how that kind of early quote leads into what later became used by governments as the policy of fascism. The bundled sticks is stronger. Centralized government is what we need, not decentralized independent people who can think for themselves and may even still have some morals. No, we want the government to take over everything, long-term planning. We know it's best, but child pornography would be all right. Anyway, Senator Rand Paul, his father, all of them have run a great campaign for liberty. They're trying to revive the country, maybe even transform the co-opted and terrible GOP party itself. But nonetheless, an inspiring speech, values we want to consider, spread, and have in the minds of everyone as we continue to set brush fires for liberty. We take you to that now. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. and that we will be beaten and that there's no future for the Tea Party. Harry, tell us, which one is it? Speaking in this Texas heat, I'm reminded of Castro. He used to give these eight-hour speeches in the Cuban sun. He was given one of these interminable speeches and from the crowd came a voice saying, peanuts, popcorn, Cracker Jacks. Castro got mad, but he went on. Five minutes later, or maybe five hours later, he heard it again, peanuts, popcorn, Cracker Jacks. And he says, I hear that again, I'm gonna kick your butt all the way to Miami. All of a sudden, the entire crowd said, peanuts, popcorn, Cracker Jacks. I did have a problem with those light bulbs. I've got a problem with my toilet. I mean, I want the government out of my bedroom, but I also want them out of my bathroom. Yeah. And tell me what kind of light bulb I can use. What kind of toilet paper? For goodness sakes, these Hollywood celebrities want to tell you how much toilet paper you can use. Is that the nanny state or what? they tell you what kind of shower heads you can have. You know, the light bulbs cost $4. I asked the Department of Energy woman, are you against choice? She said, oh no, I'm for choice in light bulbs. I said that you're precisely not for choice in light bulbs. You won't let us make a decision. By the way, do you hate poor people? How are regular people gonna afford $4 light bulbs? So President Obama <coughs> gave a prize recently, $10 million prize to Phillips Electric to develop a energy efficient, cost effective light bulb. You know how much the light bulb cost? $50. <laughs> how much did we give Phillips Electric? $10 million to develop a $50 light bulb. It's insane. We live in an anti state. There are 38 federal agencies that are armed. Now you may say we need to have a police, we need to have an army, but does the Department of Agriculture need a SWAT team? No! Recently the Department of Agriculture showed up 
with automatic weapons and with a Gestapo style SWAT team to close down a company that was doing the horrendous crime of selling milk directly from the cow. showed up at Gibson Guitar once again with armed agents. You know what their crime was? They're accused of breaking an Indian, not a U.S., an Indian labor law that says their product needs to be finished in India. It's a labor protection law, but they're being persecuted and prosecuted for breaking a law that's not even a U.S. law. We put a U.S. citizen, a Florida citizen, in jail for the crime of breaking a Honduran fishing regulation. He got eight years in prison. One of the regulations was that the fish needed to be imported in cardboard boxes, not plastic. That's a criminal offense under the Lacey Act. We've let our government get away from us. But we're at a point where we need a new generation of leaders. We need leaders who believe in the Constitution. We need to know who will be the next generation, who will be our leaders. Roger Waters asked, he said, did you trade your heroes for ghosts? Did you exchange a walk-on part in a war for a lead role in a cage? Recently, I met an Egyptian woman. When they're put on trial in Egypt, they're put in a cage. She's, she's accused of promoting secular democracy in Egypt. And yet, what do the people in Congress do to support her? They say, let's send two billion of your dollars to Egypt and maybe they'll behave better if we give them more money. Goldwater in that book, The Conscious of the Conservative, I think succinctly wrapped up what a lot of us are about when he said, I have little interest in streamlining government or making it more efficient, for I mean to reduce its size. He said, I do not, he said, I do not undertake to promote welfare, rather I propose to extend freedom. My aim, my aim is not to inaugurate new programs. My aim is not to pass white bills, but to repeal bills. My aim is not to inaugurate new programs, but to cancel old ones that do violence to the Constitution. Goldwater yeah. said that I will not attempt to discover whether legislation is needed before I have discovered whether it is constitutional. And if I am neglected, if I'm accused of neglecting my constituents' interest, I will reply that I was told that my constituents' chief interest was liberty. And in that cause, I am doing the best that I can. I can't think of a more succinct way of talking about liberty and freedom and what we're about. We have to fight it. I do believe we are in a precipice. We have a constitutional republic, but we've been losing it for decades and decades and decades. Jefferson recognized this. Jefferson said that a pure democracy would be nothing more than mob rule. We had to have rules. There are certain things the majority can't take away from us. They can't take away the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, any of the Bill of Rights. The majority has no right. Those rights were given to us by our Creator, and they pre-exist government. a government, we now have a president who fundamentally misunderstands it. It amazes me that people say that he actually taught constitutional law. <laughs> he said recently that because Obamacare had passed by a majority, to him a significant majority, that the Supreme Court had no right to rule on its constitutionality. <laughs> we stand at a precipice in our country where we must make decisions, and I don't think we have a lot of time left. Phil Graham used to talk about there's getting too many people in the wagon and not enough people pulling the wagon. The wagon's getting heavy. Less and less people are working. Less and less people are paying the taxes. We have to do there's so many people on the receiving end and so few people on the working end that it becomes, you know, we slide into Western socialism. And I'm afraid we're in that, going in that direction. 
We are at a point where we're borrowing $50,000 a second. We have to do something about it. But in doing so, we need to recognize that we do have choices. It's not all bad news. We have a great country. I tell people it's not that we are inherently exceptional, but our ideas were exceptional. The ideas and heritage of our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence are exceptional. <laughs> once again, if we will believe in the system of capitalism that made us great, if we will know and understand that if you want to help your fellow man, if you want a society and a civilization that can create wealth to help your fellow man and to be humanitarian, it's capitalism. It creates wealth like no other country ever has. But we have to believe in ourselves again. We cannot believe that because your neighbor has three cars, and you have a moped that we're going to send the president to take one of their cars and get you a car. <laughs> we have to believe that we want to increase that pie. That pie of jobs and wealth can increase if we believe in freedom. If we do, we will thrive again. I hope to be at the forefront of that and to continue to fight for you. And I thank you very much for having me. Have you been to InfoWarsShop.com lately? Express your inner patriot with these brand new InfoWars t-shirts. Say it loud with the InfoWars bullhorn shirt. Or educate the sheeple with the Bill of Rights shirt. Grope the public's mind with the TSA shirt. And with this shirt, you can let the dark side know of the Rebel Alliance's power. All available at InfoWarsShop.com sick of the globalist eugenicist control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die start purifying your water with pro pure my friends i've done a lot of research and the best gravity filter out there bar none is pro pure and it's available discounted at infowars.com its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth there's no priming required it's nsf 42 certified optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95 percent easy to set up and use does doesn't require electricity. Purify water from lakes, streams, ponds, and wells. This filter system leaves in beneficial minerals, which is key. Save money by not buying bottled water and avoid BPA that leaches from the plastic. ProPure is the best gravity-fed filter out there. It's what my family uses. Infowars.com already has the lowest price on ProPure. But if you add the promo code WATER at checkout, you get an additional 10% off at Infowars.com. You can also call to order 888-253-3139. We are back on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. We are joined now by Chelsea Schilling. She's a writer for WorldNet Daily, and she is exposing the chilling fact that Facebook and other social network sites are making it easier for pedophiles to find their victims and to link between each other. And this is an ongoing serious issue. Thanks for joining us, Chelsea. Thank you for having me. Uh, so explain basically what's going on, where your uh, research has led, all the dark avenues, and then let's get into the issues for modern society, how we preserve civil rights while prosecuting people who are clearly harming children. Uh, but first of all, Facebook, why are they allowing this to go on, and, and what are you finding in your research? Well, first off, what I found was unimaginable. And, you know, I really expected to find something in there, but never nearly what I did find. It was it was pretty shocking. I mean, we're talking about children who are having their photos uploaded to Facebook by cell phone in many cases, not every case, and also videos of adults sexually abusing these children, actually having intercourse on these videos and photos. So that was some of the worst stuff I found. And I found this by going into Facebook and creating alias profiles. In other words, they weren't me. I was pretending to be somebody else. I took photos off the internet of, of sexy women who were promiscuous and, and I built this huge uh, profile out of it. And I used terms like Lolita 13, you know, PTHC, which is preteen hardcore pornography. And I used those as my likes, including the term incest, which Facebook apparently tends to allow because every anytime you search in their search bar, 
you can often find groups for incest and likes. And so I use those terms. And because I use those terms, pedophiles were able to locate me based on my interests and sort of deduce that I was one of them. And either they friended me or I friended them. And many times while these photos were completely available to the public and I did see their albums, that's how I knew who to friend. Um, they, whenever they did friend me and I got in, they, the albums became much worse. And I started seeing this and these, these pedophiles are trading photos among themselves. If you go through their friends list, there are hundreds of people long um, and there are people just like them, that's the thing. There are two types of friends that these pedophiles tend to have. They aren't on these accounts, these Facebook accounts like you and I, to speak with our friends and family. These are just completely fictitious people here where they upload photos and it's a false user. And the reason they're on there is to trade photos with other pedophiles. And usually they are original images of their own sexual abuse that they upload and they trade with these pedophiles. The other kind of friend that these pedophiles tend to have are America's children. They're unsuspecting children. They go out and they friend students in high school, middle school, whatever the case may be. They find children and they friend them. And in some cases, they'll strike up a conversation, they'll chat with them, they'll exchange photos if they can, often nude photos. And then even in some cases, they will actually try to meet these children. Uh, so the kind of evidence they're posting on Facebook, is it the kind of evidence law enforcement can use to issue warrants? Are these clear cases where people actually are hurting children? If, if so, why are they not being prosecuted? Uh, but then let's get into how this ties into the overall online atmosphere where they're trying to curb civil liberties. Clearly, these are crimes, uh, but they're going after people for inappropriate content on Facebook, YouTube, shutting down sites for using news clips and things like that while leaving up clips of nudity, of, of violence, of copyright infringement, and on and on. Isn't it ridiculous? Now, when I actually found these photos, and I have to say this, in every case I reported them. So if they were a child being sexually abused by an adult, as soon as I found it, it went straight to the FBI via its IC3.gov reporting form. That was the best way that I found to do it. I called the FBI several different offices and spoke with them, and they all referred me to that one site so that I could actually turn in some of those photos. But the thing was, in the beginning, I started flagging many of the photos, not the most severe ones, but many of the photos on Facebook, hoping that the profiles would be taken down after Facebook got wind of it. And that wasn't necessarily the case. In many cases, those photos remained up there for two weeks, three weeks, and it was just awful going back there and seeing that I had reported these. It didn't let me report them again because it says, hey, you've already reported these photos. You know, you can't do that again. And, and the photos didn't come down. So then I went to Facebook. I couldn't leave it up there much longer. I mean, that was my responsibility to go to the FBI. Um, I took the photos that Facebook wouldn't take down and I actually took them to the FBI and they were down within 24 hours. The FBI did have a real positive response with individual photos that are reported to them. Now the problem is there's a prevention problem. So, uh, you know, these photos should never have made it onto Facebook in the first place. That is, right. that's a real issue here. So the law enforcement authorities can only deal with what's reported to them. They can handle these images and they do a great job doing it. But the problem is, if there's not a prevention tactic here, you know, we have a, an issue that's spiraling out of control. And Facebook could really easily fix this, you know, without this becoming a huge, you know, outside control thing, they could police themselves. One of the ways that Facebook, I believe, can do that without spending too much money or resources on this would really be to just take down the incest groups, the PTHC groups, the kids sex young groups, the F young girls groups, the F young boys groups. I could sit here and go on and I have in my stories about these types of groups that are actually permitted on Facebook. And even if they do take them down many times, they're in there for a very long time. This is how pedophiles meet one another. It's how they get validation for what they're doing. And then it's also creates a market for their, their photos so that they can exchange them. It's very simple to find those terms. You go to the Facebook search engine, you just type them in and you get results very easily. So this isn't something that Facebook can't police on its own. Right now, 
it's something that Facebook appears unwilling to do. Chelsea, where do you feel like the rubber meets the road with SOPA, with ACTA, with CISPA, and other online treaties and bills are trying to push through? We've seen some of the greatest flourishing of liberty and political discussions. All that's been enlivened from online. But of course, it does make it easier for certain types of criminals uh, to associate along the lines of what we're talking about and so forth. How can we protect children and protect ourselves online while keeping freedom alive? And what do you make of this uh, type of legislation? See, that's the end goal of a lot of people who've written me, especially. You know, why should we have to force Facebook to do this from outside law enforcement or investigations and such? You know, if it comes down to it, it is child porn. If, if it doesn't come down, you know, I don't have a problem. This is illegal content. Somebody needs to do something about this. Sure. But first and foremost, I would like for Facebook to take the initiative. I mean, think about it. With their IPO launching, this is a huge risk factor. I personally believe that it probably should have been disclosed in their S-1 filing with the SEC. I spoke to them about that. It is not in their current S-1 filing. This is a risk. This is a huge risk. It could cost them money in a big way. And I really feel like it would be easy for the company to sort of police this. And then, you know, who knows how investors might feel about that. I think I'd probably feel better as an investor um, putting my money into Facebook and knowing that this was a real prerogative for them, that they weren't going to allow this stuff to invade the site that I'm investing in. Sure. Yeah. Well, we, we have to find ways to do both. Uh, what do you make of pedophile rings in terms of where it's been connected with high up political levels? Uh, we saw the scandals with various coaches, Sandusky and the people from the other universities last year. Uh, some of those reports indicated that a number of even higher level, more elite, richer donor type people may have been protected in those scandals. Uh, how does that parallel with the stuff that's happening in the online realm? I honestly think that you know, this is my personal opinion. This is an, an extremely uncomfortable and inconvenient subject. Nobody wants to even acknowledge that it's such a huge problem. They look the other way. Nobody wants to talk about this. You know, I don't get my jolly sitting here talking about poor children being raped on Facebook. This is not something that anybody enjoys talking about. However, if we look the other way, if we pretend it's not happening, I don't care if it's a pastor doing it. I don't care if it's a Boy Scout leader doing it. I don't care if it's, you know, whatever it is, a teacher, it doesn't matter. We don't need to be protecting these people. You know, we need to be protecting the kids because the problem is in a lot of these cases, these children are being abused many times by their own parents. They don't have people to stick up for them. And that's why this is such an issue. You know, who is going to support the children in this situation, if not Facebook, where they're, you know, protecting the victims of this situation. And, you know, I didn't mention earlier that I did spend two full months trying to get a response from Facebook about this. I called them, I emailed them multiple times, and I was really trying to get them to go on record. I wanna work with them. I don't want to force their hand from the outside and try to get the DOJ to investigate or, or Congress to do something about it. I, that's something that to me would be a last resort. I really prefer that Facebook would handle this internally. And the thing is, they, you know, they sent me a statement about two hours after my part one of the series ran. This is a four part series right. and it ran on, on Matt Drudge's site, the Drudge Report. And because of that, and because of our great readers, we received 1.5 million hits on that first part. And so it got Facebook's attention. Within two hours of it running, they decided to contact me and they sent a statement that really seemed sort of recycled and didn't answer any of the questions I had, and I sent them a very long list of them. So we ended up having an off-the-record uh, conference call with some Facebook executives, and I can't go into what we discussed there, clearly, but I will say that the status quo is where it's at. It, you know, from my impression coming out of that, nothing was about to change. And I think that there, if I were to speculate, and I think it's a pretty good guess. I believe that to uh, actually do something about this, Facebook would actually have to acknowledge that it really is a problem on their website. And to do that when they're about to launch an IPO, 
to them, it's a huge risk factor. They don't want to come out with this and acknowledge that this issue is, is as big as it is on their website. But that's illustrative, too, that it's so difficult to address this issue, but Zuckerberg's brag that we're spying on all of you. Google has pretty much said similar things. They're tracking everything online. They consider the general population to be privy to being spied upon, but they won't go after clear-cut criminals, or at least people who uh, think it's cool to associate with that criminal culture. Isn't it ridiculous? You hear all these complaints about how Facebook is deeming comments inappropriate and flagging them and such, and, and people are complaining because it's political speech, it's free speech, it's, it's essentially stuff that doesn't really matter to anybody and doesn't harm anybody at all mm -hmm. and is not illegal. And, and, you know, somehow they always find those comments, don't they? They can regulate those comments, but for some reason, it's difficult for Facebook to find the term incest in its groups and PTHC and all these horrible terms using, you know, that the pedophiles use to identify one another and they like. I, I really have a hard time believing that. Yeah, and I think that speaks volumes. Chelsea Schilling, your articles are at WorldNet Daily. Uh, they've also been covered, as you pointed out, on the Drudge Report. Thanks for joining us, and we'll speak to you in the future. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. And that's it for tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Please consider subscribing to PrisonPlanet.tv. We, uh, we count on your support to get the word out about our broadcast, cover the hard topics, the questions the mainstream media will not address. Thanks. We'll be back again tomorrow. Good night.